All right, well, welcome everyone. Call to order this Milburn uh, School District 24 Board of Education regular meeting, August 23rd, 2021. Uh, roll call, please, Brett. Ms. Ball? Yes. Mr. Coleman? Here. Mr. Gray? Here. Mr. Larissa? Here. Mr. Murphy? Here. Mr. Pettorini? Here. Mr. Quinone? Here. Welcome everyone. I understand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> Do we have any public comments? Does anyone have any addition of non-action items? Action items, final reading of the approved board policy. I, I took a review of them, and I think there's maybe three that we want to look at. <clears throat> Nothing major, but I think it's important to call out the school district legal, legal status. We're going to get one, one, ten. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what were the other ones you want to pull out and then we can well, well not necessarily pull out but just take a look at them. okay just that i think it's important to look at these and um just understand the gravity of the policy here so 110 just talks about school district legal legal status what we as a board are legally responsible for i think it's in the final paragraph again there's nothing here that i think we should amend or, or omit um, and I don't think we could because of the uh, these are laws. But just to keep in mind here, um, the school board constitutes a corporate uh, body corporate that possesses all the usual powers of the corporation for public purposes. And in that name, may sue and be sued. But I think the key phrase here that we call out, or at least that I think needs to be brought to attention, is in that name. So the name of the school board here, to me, it, it, it's not implied to any individuals within the school board, but it's actually the constant, you know, the body as it's constituted as a school board. So that's just one I wanted, you know, as we talk about these things, because we always hear different, you know, perhaps different uh, things being proposed. And um, so it's important to be noted here in 110 that as a body, yes, we may be sued. Okay? So nothing to you know i wouldn't suggest pulling that out nothing to be changed here but just that we're all aware and then the other one is 2 240. there's some optional verbiage in there It's addressing having, sorry, let's, let's go up a little bit, sorry Jason. Yeah, words importing gender throughout this policy manual world. Words importing the masculine and or feminine gender include all gender neutral inclusive pronouns. I can't think of when pronouns that import gender are utilized in this, but also I think that that is that, that definitely is optional if we look up the, uh, the reference for the laws. I don't want to go through all of the policies and make sure we have to revise them all to make sure that we have neutral, gender neutral and inclusive pronouns. So I would suggest that that's one thing that we just strike. Well, in masculine and feminine, that's feminine and gender anyway. That's sex. <laughs> gender would be man, woman, boy, girl. So it's got to be worded correctly. Yeah, I don't think yeah and again i don't think that anything applicable is within the policies as i've read them in the past i don't think we want to get into that or at least i don't want to does anybody have any comments on that i mean maybe i'll just update it if possible because gender does not refer to male or female 
country part first to sex sex. So you could say sex instead of gender, <laughs> or you could change. Or we could just strike it. You could say importing the um, all gender neutral inclusive pronouns. Sounds like somebody just wanted to toss out a blanket thing that we didn't really mean to imply one gender or the other and that everything should be yeah. equal. Yeah, I read it more like that, John. Um, is, it, is it not saying that when a masculine or feminine is used, it also includes gender neutral and inclusive? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of covering We're importing. to say, or am I reading that? It's just a statement in support saying, okay. If we say this, it right. really yeah, inclusive of all. That it's inclusive of everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. As long as it's not understood that we need to go through and change pronouns and. Because there's truthfully, to avoid. Uh, in reading through this, and Jason, I don't know if you remember Veronica, I don't remember seeing he, she at all in any of these. I just don't want to get in the exercise of having to, to go through. But that's no. If that's if we collectively understand it that way, that it's inclusive of everyone, despite the masculine or feminine, feminine pronoun being used. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're good, leaving it as is. Well, I I actually see a stick where I I would like to see us. Acknowledge the difference between gender and sex and make sure that we are, if we're going to go to the, which I think it's actually good that we're taking the time to say these things, I actually think it's really good. But let's go ahead and rework it so we're saying it right. So that male, female is sex, man, woman is gender, or he, she. You could use both pronouns. But we just may rework it so we're not accidentally labeling male, female as gender. Then, then what I would suggest is that as we vote here, we vote for the adoption of all of these, with the exception of this one, so that that work can be done to revise it and yeah. then adopt, move to adopt at another yeah. session. Do you want to, um, Vanessa, put your uh, spin on it? Because you seem to well, have a so we could, better understanding. I think instead of saying the masculine or feminine gender, throughout this policy manual, we're importing. Um, gender will include all neutral inclusive pronouns. Yeah, if you remove the sex language, the language that's specific to the to the sex of the person, then it, well, that's what you're talking about. Yeah. You can import all gender. So take out the masculine and or feminine and gender. That section could come off. And then you say words importing all gender neutral and inclusive pronouns. If you put an and instead of a slash, it might read better. So did you pull out? So should it read words? Importing gender include all gender neutral inclusive pronouns. Awesome. So we'll pull that one out and we'll check it next time when, uh, when we've made the changes. You want to talk about the last one too, Arson? And then there was just the last one, uh, 3.30, line and staff relations. And what it does is it covers the, the administrative staff relations. And there is a, there's something you're, you're supposed to be able to pull up. I wasn't able to pull up the, the uh, okay. And Jason, is this this is out on? Okay, this isn't out on press policy, right? This is press policy. But you're not out on the press site, correct? No, no. Okay, because I was. That's my point. Is I was unable to pull up.
content out on press. Okay. Um, you're looking for the chain of command for this district specifically? Yeah. Yeah, no, I've just, the content wouldn't come up on the press policy site, is what I'm saying. Oh, okay. So that's all, I just wanted to see it. Okay. Got you. That's, oh, <laughs> there that's, there all, is. that's all I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. We have a motion for all of these except 240. I move to approve board policies 110 through 330 with the exception of 2.240. All second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Do we have to do a roll call? No, no money. Okay. Uh, hearing no names, it is <clears throat> moving on to approve thought exchange contract in the amount of $13,230. I'd like to make a motion to approve the thought exchange contract in the amount of $13,230. Second. Does anyone have questions on this one? We talked about we've talked about this and uh, the options. It actually is less than what I quoted the board earlier. So, but it is the last year of this lower price. So unless they change that, and I don't know that I'll recommend it in the future. But we will. One last try. Cross that bridge. <laughs> <line. laughs> it's such a useful tool. Any other comments on this? Um, roll call, please, Ron. Mr. Quignoni? Yes. Ms. Boss? Yes. Mr. Foman? Yes. Mr. Gray? Yes. Mr. Morrison? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Federini? Yes. The motion passed. Yes. Uh, public display of tentative budget. Dr. John, would you, would you like to show it first? Uh, let's pull up the presentation. Because that kind of summarizes what's in it. And technically, the, the budget, and, and now that I'm looking at it, maybe I should have made that August 23rd instead of August 24th for budget approval public display. It will be available for public display tomorrow, August 24th. Uh, the legal ad will be in the Daily Herald either tomorrow or Wednesday. We'll have one more opportunity to go through the budget and, and go through details on September 13th. And then the budget hearing and adoption is scheduled for September 27th. This is I, this is in the shared drive that I invited all of you to, so you can you want to go through it later. This basically just talks about each of the funds and what the funds, uh, what kinds of uh, revenue they get, as well as what kinds of. No, this is more the uh, what's paid out of those funds. Uh, just remember, um, there are things that are unknown that are going to occur throughout the year and. The last two years have been definitely a, a way for us to get to know that. But substitute costs, utility costs, staff development re requests, uh, special education, either CDAL or out of district students that can easily be anywhere from forty to a hundred thousand dollars a student. All those things will, you know, dramatically change the, the outlook of the budget that we look at. Um, but you know, know that 
<clears throat> you know, our culture and the way we look at things here is to try to only spend money that is necessary. So uh, that's one thing that I was really pleased when I first came to Melbourne and, and that still continues. Uh, the budget, and this kind of goes back to several years ago when the state wasn't paying in a timely manner, but, but we always put in one year of revenue payments from state and federal dollars, as well as one year of property taxes. And so depending on the year, sometimes I, there have been times when, let's say this year we're going to only get two of the state payments and then they, they give us five next year. Um, so it, it does vary. We have benefited from the evidence-based funding formula. Um, and it's one of those things, originally they were going to be re-looking at all those allocations based on enrollment, but because of COVID, they put that off a, a little bit. Our numbers have gone down. So at the point they do that, I don't know what, what that will do. Uh, this budget also includes about half a million dollars in federal funding. Because for the ESSERS grants, <clears throat> even though the the grants phase out at, I think, in 22, 23, and 24 in September of each year. We still, when we write the grant, we have to write for the entire amount. So not knowing, so we have to put in the entire revenue and the entire expenditures, but knowing that we can modify that grant as we move forward. We pretty much have spent all of the Lake County CARES Act money, or we have spent all the Lake County CARES Act money the first ESSER grant that we got was fairly small, 30 or 60,000, I believe. And then by the end of this year, we will have spent all of the ESSER II money, which was 164,000, I think, something like that. And then the ESSER III money is 414,000. Uh, and then we're also getting additional dollars for food service because we have some free lunches this year and that's at a higher reimbursement rate than what we typically have had. Hopefully we'll also see increased numbers of students eating. This just gives you an idea of where our money comes from for the education fund. Uh, federal revenue is about 0.9%. Correct. Okay. Well, I knew I should have put that outside the are there state 25% and property taxes are about 6% and then everything else is 0.7% fees and such so the bulk of our money comes from property taxes with more support from the state some support from the feds and a little money from local now when I did the revenue I included Normally we're running at gyms and those kind of things and with COVID we are not sure what we're going to do. So I, I kind of looked at what we received last year when I put in the revenues for this year because I figured they would be pretty similar. And then if we get anything extra than that we'll only, you know, benefit the district. Thank you guys. How much variance is there between, you know, the, the share of the pie between, you know, our district and other districts? Is it pretty similar? Uh, it's, it's really different. For instance, like Round Lake, uh, which is um, in a more economically disadvantaged area as far as when you look at uh, free and reduced lunch and state, state revenues, they're going to get more of their money from the state and less of their money from property taxes. So it just depends on what district you're in. There are other districts along the North Shore that the property, you know, get almost no state money. Uh, whereas we're getting, well, that was, what was it, 30, roughly 30 percent? 3.7 million, so yeah, 25 percent. So, so some of them are getting almost nothing. Uh, so it really does depend on the wealth of the district and the way that, you know, they look at not only your free and reduced lunch status, but also your assessed value of the properties within your district. With donations, uh, have you classified as other? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, expenditures. Um, the bulk of the money is salaries and benefits. And what is that? Where? What percentage of purple? On the right, no, the blue, I guess, maybe. Salaries? 
Yeah, what percent does that say? 70. 70. 70, okay. So that's actually not bad. Usually this, if you're getting up closer to 80%, then that's kind of a little bit of a concern that you aren't spending enough on the other things that you need in the district, but 70% isn't bad. Um, actually, the spending, the benefits then are separate too, so that's 16%, so that's 86. So we are spending the bulk of our money on people. And that's one of the things that when we look at, you know, in the future, if you look at adjusting the budget or making changes to the budget, where you're going to get the biggest bulk of your money is salaries and benefits. And we never like to deal with teachers, but that's part of why uh, I think the long range planning is to look as people retire as, as you know, if in fact enrollment continues to decline, which it may or may not now that the housing market is picked up again. But if it does decline, hopefully we're able to do that through attrition rather than the cuts that were made. Did that start, what, about 12 years ago? Yeah. I know it was, they started before I came and we continued to make cuts for the first couple of years that I was here before the referendum. So <clears throat> just remember that the bulk of your money is in salaries and benefits. So just to give you an idea, the salaries are up not quite a million dollars this year over last year. We did add uh, two or three positions um, and some additional days for our media tech people. Um, I typically put in money for lane changes and I have two more tuition reimbursements sitting on my desk now that just came in. So usually in the fall and then again in December, January, people who've gone to school and have a chance to move across on the salary schedules when, when I'll get those uh, tuition reimbursement requests that also have a transcript that often will cause them to be able to move across the salary schedule. I did just roughly, and we don't know how much it's going to be, but if you approve the stipend for hybrid teaching tonight, um, I did plug in 180000 I think I figured 100 teachers at 30 hours. 30 periods um, just to come up with that number. Uh, and, and then substitute costs are in there as well. Um, we don't really know where that's going to be uh, this year. Hopefully it won't be that bad. It has substitute teachers as well as substitute paraprofessionals. Um, and then the benefits are about 2.35 million, uh, which is an increase over the prior year was 2.14. But the other thing that happened last year is we had several positions that when someone left, it was a, if it was a position that we didn't need immediately, we didn't fill it. So we had some paraprofessionals who left um, that we didn't have to fill those positions until this year. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to point out we're not adding 2.4 and we're not adding 0.4 administrator. It's only because last year we had two part-time administrators on the end of their retirement leave early. I was just looking at Elizabeth was a 0.6 and Correct. then when we hired Autumn to replace, uh, so the SPEs are actually up 0.4. From last year. From last year. But not from the year before. Now. Correct, not from the year before. Right. I just want to be clear because some yeah. people will have a question like, when did we hire a new administrator? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's the difference between the 2021 budget and the 2022 budget. Correct. I just want to clarify. Yeah, no, I, I understand that. And same with the ELL teacher. We right. just didn't hire one last year. Right. We got permission to hire them, but then when we didn't hire one, I didn't, I don't think in the final budget I included that number. So. That's an increase in the budget that wasn't, even though it was approved last year, the, the salary wasn't in there. Correct. Yeah. Do you know off the top of your head what like the the net difference was between the, the growth rate this year versus last year? The ballpark? In like either or. I mean just kind of curious where we're at as far as you go back to the other side. Are you talking salaries or are you talking? Yeah. Um, yeah, so for example, we're, we grew 
to 10, 10 4 at 9 5. How does that compare with other years? Probably close. The, the one thing with our paraprofessional, with our PSRP union, because we're striving to get to that $15 an hour that we have the mandate each year that we have to get to a certain level. Uh, I know they do have higher increase. The teacher increase this year was only 3%, I believe 3%, um, as opposed to the prior year it was higher. Uh, so it does vary, but um, I can't tell you exactly without. We'll take the picture. Yeah. But it, it, it kind of varies from year to year. But this is the last year of the teacher agreement. And the, was it, was it a three year? Three years, I think it was. The two prior years were a higher salary increase. The other thing that we've had happen as well is we had quite a few people retire this year. And then we replaced them with uh, individuals that were lower on the salary schedule than the people leaving. Sorry, right, just to make sure that I'm clear, that 9.5 million. That was last year, and then 10.4 says so 5 is what we're expecting this. Project, project Correct. So that's what, a 9, that's a 9% increase, right, in salary? And we're thinking that potentially with the, uh, with the teacher contract expiring and us renegotiating, it's feasible that that's going to go up again into 2023. Yeah, now, the other thing that this also includes is probably. 250 to 270,000 in substitute costs that we, because the FY21 was our amended budget where we looked at where we really were and then shifted dollars so that they were in the appropriate lines. So last year, because of the fact that for whatever reason, we didn't use a lot of our substitute costs, we didn't spend a lot on substitutes. Uh, you know, we had the ability for teachers who were out to teach from home and, and uh, we didn't have a lot of people out last year comparatively. We also only had a partial day where kids were in the building. So that substitute cost, there is a difference there as well. We have additional sub costs. Now, I budgeted additional sub costs this year that we didn't spend last year. Sorry, I'm not, I guess I'm, I'm in front of the difference there is what nine hundred ish thousand dollars, right? Like the one hundred and eighty for teacher for hybrid teaching, two hundred and sixty-five. Like that doesn't add up to the difference between those two years. No, no, it doesn't. So what what else is it included here? That well, that you'd have your salary increases as well. Oh, and, two, and then salary. the other thing, like I've mentioned before, is we had several. I don't know the exact number of paraprofessional and some of our other staff members that resigned last year that if we didn't need them, we didn't replace them. So we had the savings of their salary uh, for the balance of that year as well. I know we had, we did have one teacher, two teachers that we took from half-time to full-time last year. Um, but we had other people who, you know, made up that difference. Am I totally confusing you? No, it makes sense. I, I like I inter well I understand the rule. I understand what you're saying. Um, I guess just my the reason I'm probing and my concern is just you know we're expecting this to increase by some percentage again next year. You know we're not increasing our revenue by the same by the same amount, right? So we're just increasing our spend and increasing what, yeah. what we have to pay it with. And how far is that going to go until it's the point where we're in trouble? I'm going to guess maybe another year or two, and then you'll need to look at making making some of those reductions. And, and like I said, we were you know we kind of planned to be able to do those through attrition. Yeah. But it is one of those things when we did the referendum mm -hmm. several years ago, what is that, six seven years ago. You know that money is pretty much gone now. So we're pretty much I mean not gone it's still there but you know with the things that we've done we've added positions we've, we've done things like that that. You know, soon we're going to be at a point where the revenue that we get, and even now the revenue we get doesn't always match the expenses. Yeah. So this represented here, Jose, just to clarify, it's 180000 for hybrid teaching, substitute cost 265000 
two futures is another 150,000, that's 595,000 right there. Mm. So that 600 of that 900, and so you're really looking at a 3% increase, which would be a salary increase across the board. And that's kind of even out by, you know, pair pros might have a higher increase than that. Okay. They did have a higher increase than that. But um, some of our teachers retired, so we replaced the salary. So but it's always that give and take and other stuff. But in, to answer your question long term, yes, this is not sustainable without either increasing revenue or decreasing expenses. Right. For next year, we're okay. The year after, we're okay. Okay. And then one of our bonds goes off in two years, right? Yes. So that'll free up a bit of money. Um, well, it doesn't free up anything <laughs> except it reduces taxes for, for our taxpayers significantly. Um, but the question is at that point, do you ask for a uh, uh, go for referendum, depending on what the context is at that time? It's something to consider. A smaller, in, it still won't be a full decrease drop off. Taxpayers would still see a significant decrease. That's a discussion for down the road. But something to, to start thinking about, or do you start reducing programs? And that, that's always a choice. Historically, has our salary always been going up 3% a year? Or is it On average? Yeah. yeah. Probably on average overall. And I know especially with our paraprofessionals and some of our classified staff, we've kind of made efforts to, well, and, and even with the teachers too, to try and get them closer to the market rate um, because sometimes it is difficult to find people and you also want people to want to stay mm -hmm. at, at Milburn, um, which is a challenge because there are other districts that have a lot more money they can put into salaries and benefits than we do here in Milburn. So it's always kind of a game as to what can we afford in order to keep people and attract people versus, um, you know, what we can't afford. It's always a tough, tough decision. Can you remind me that um, retirement community housing that's being built on yeah. 45? Is that going to include our like, add to our revenue? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And the last guy, last time I heard there were at least 15 of them sold, and that was a couple months ago. I've been amazed. I, I get a couple emails or a couple real estate emails that'll come that kind of show me homes that have sold, et cetera, and when they aren't done. I, I've really been amazed that, you know, every week or two there's another one or two that'll sell there. Uh, and I, I was kind of surprised because of the square footage, et cetera, uh, you know, it's a little, it's, it's in the, you know, low to mid, low to upper 300,000 range. So that definitely will add to our our base. But it is they they do seem to be, at least from what I remember in discussing with the developers, they do seem to be selling faster than I anticipated, or than the developers even anticipated. So we won't we won't see that money next year. We'll see it for FY 24. Or will we see it? You, you may see some of it in FY23 because it's basically what's ever on the book by usually it's around the beginning of November. Whenever they yeah, close there's, there, there's people living there. there. Yeah, I, I drove through there the other day and I saw at least one person rearranging things in his garage and he had it slide out. And um, you know, I was I was really impressed. And the homes that they're building first seem to be on the Milburn side. There is a the northern portion, I believe, is um, Woodland. Oh, I know it is. Woodland and then... Southern. Pardon? Southern is Woodland. That's right. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting confused. I, I don't do well with directions. <laughs> yeah, correct. The southern portion, and they're building on the northern portion right now. Correct. So for those homes that are out there now, let's say Melbourne would capture $7,000. 
but they don't have a full year. So in FY24, we get $7,000 per house that's going up ish. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 And, and when we get to the debt service fund, you can kind of see how much it went up from last year to this year. Yeah. And and the next two years, there's a significant bump each year, and then it drops off totally unless the board decides to do a referendum or do something to, to try and capture part of that money, but still give a break to taxpayers. Purchase services are about the same, just slightly higher. Um, during the month between now and, and adoption, I'll look again at the software. We did have some uh, multi-year renewals that came up this year, and I don't know if I captured all of those. I want to double check and make sure that I actually did capture all of those. Um, supply significantly up this year, but they were significantly down last year because kids were so remote. We didn't go through as many supplies um, out of the education fund as what we typically had. And then, I don't think we bought any of those with the, with the grant dollars, so I think just the fact that we only had kids here a partial day made a difference in how much money we spent on supplies. Capital outlay is slightly down. Um, that's okay. It's, I know it's there. Other objects, this is the special ed, and in FY21 we spent about 600000 This year we're looking about 440000 I even put in, I think, three additional students that we currently don't have. Um, so like I said, this is the one that I mentioned will go up or down, just to kind of, if somebody moves into the district with two special ed kids in either a CDAL program or private placement, and you know, you can be up a hundred or two hundred thousand in your expenses. Uh, it also includes membership fees. The non-capitalized equipment is equipment between more than five hundred dollars but less than twenty-five hundred dollars. Um, sorry, quick question in regards to the CDAL. Um, mm -hmm. How many how many students do we currently have that are serving uh, for private education? Well, it's, it's, it's because of their IEPs. Um, Mr. Rollins had just sent that today. I haven't looked at it. No, those are the ones tuition and getting sent today. Oh, right? tuition did. Yeah, I had about 50 tabs open. How much is on our downside? Let me see. I can probably. <laughs> I can look that up for you. Cool. 30 seconds. Because you said it, it, it runs about. $40,000? Well, it depends. Thousand. Like, there are um, three in CEDAW and two in private placement right now. We typically have roughly eight students that are either CEDAW and or private placement every year. So we are down. We did have some students who moved out of the district last year who were in some of those programs, uh, actually moved out of the state. But, but it does vary between, you know, five is kind of a low, low number and it could be eight or it could even go up to 10. But it's a fairly small number of students, but looks like currently the highest program we have anyone in is um, about 70,000. Um, no, I take that back. I, I don't have the, these others maybe in that same range too. There are daily rates, so I'd have to multiply that out again. No, I think the question was how many, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> she said it was three in the CL program and two in private therapeutics. Right. So five. Yeah, five total. Okay. One to the next one. Uh yeah, you were there. Uh termination benefits. This is the health insurance that we offer to our retirees. Um, looking at the people who are still going to be on it, plus the people who just retired, 
we're right about at the same amount we spent last year, 25,600. So the total budget is just a little over 15 million. Uh, last year it was 13.9. So the um, uh, pension, where does that come out of? Is it salary or is it the the the, uh, the pension that we pay for our employees? Yeah. The PRS, the the, pen, the pension on the administrators and the teachers, comes out of the education fund budget. The pension for the classified staff, um, so it would include bus drivers, custodians, paraprofessionals, before and after school club, clerical staff, media clerks. Uh, that comes out of Fund 50, the IMRF Social Security Fund that has a separate levy. So when you were um, in that pie chart, it was like the salary is about 70%, benefits was about 15%. So does that include all the different line items? No, well, that's only the education fund. That's the education fund. And the other one is a totally separate fund, and that's 570, 590,000 additional that we spend. Okay. So we don't pay teacher retirement. We pay a very small right. portion. It's like a little over 1%. And, and teachers pay teacher retirement. Right. 9%. And the state supposedly pays teacher retirement on behalf of the district because we have to plug it into the budget. I plugged in, and we never know because the state, they can't calculate how much that cost is until after they close the year. Um, so I plugged in $8 million in the budget, but we really won't know what that cost is until like a year from now when they're doing the audit because the numbers that they get from the state, they don't get them until after the close of the year. But regardless, we're not paying. It's not coming out of our pocket. Correct. Correct. But for the IMRF fund that is coming out of the IM is coming out of the IMRF Social Security budget. Okay. Correct. Okay. Go ahead and keep going. I'll try and keep this up a little bit to do the uh, operations and maintenance fund. Basically, it's taking care of repairing school buildings, keeping things clean, et cetera, the building and grounds area, snow removal, et cetera. It only receives local funding, property tax revenue, building rental revenue, and interest income. Um, the majority of the dollars are property taxes, with a smaller portion, looks like about 25%, being from um, local sources. And that's mainly from um, rentals, et cetera. And expenditures. Um, this is another one where we have salaries and benefits. So the salaries are you know, yeah. thirty-seven percent. Thirty-seven percent on the benefits are ten, so forty-seven total. So in this one, we spend about half of the money on salaries and benefits, and the other half on supplies and. Uh, repairs, purchase services. Usually, that's paying a, a electrician, a plumber, somebody to come out and do work for us. Capital outlay is a fairly small portion, um, as well as non-capitalized equipment. Which you know, the capitalized and non-capitalized equipment a lot of times are uh, lawn mowers, uh, floor cleaners, uh, vacuum cleaners, some of those kinds of things. Uh, salaries about 600,000, benefits about 151,000, purchase services 367,000, supplies about 355,000, capital outlay 25, other objects um, 27,000, and non capitalized equipment about 27,000. Debt service uh, this is what pays our bonds. And that amount this year is now. This also includes the iPad lease, which is a little over two hundred thousand, I believe, or two hundred one thousand seventeen. And we transfer that money from the education fund into the debt service fund. Uh, but the balance of that then is our bonds. Our bonds are like four million four hundred forty thousand. And then there's also some fees of 
four to six hundred dollars that we pay uh, on this bond uh, that it pays the interest and principal. So you can see that from last year to this year, there is a, a, an increase in the uh, debt service bond. And like I said, you're going to see that for the next couple of years. I'm going to go to the You said it's an increasing amount that. So I, I don't know what that number is, what, two, three percent increase from last year? So mm -hmm. is it going to increase at that rate, or is it like a much bigger balloon thing at the end? I can share the schedule with you. I, I can look at the schedule yeah. and send you guys. But, but it basically, it, it's, it's increasing much more significantly <laughs> these last four or five years. And their thought at the time they implemented this was that as the district continued to increase the number of homes, that the tax base would increase so that people wouldn't feel the impact of it. And then not long after that is when the uh, housing market crashed and nobody was buying or building new homes. Yeah. Um, so as a result, now people are feeling this impact as we go through the, the next couple of years. Or actually the last two or three years has been pretty significant hike. So it could be very painful in the next two years. Yeah. I know last year I got a couple inquiries and I compiled some information and sent to them and I think just the fact that one of them was a realtor I can't remember who the other individual was but but part of when people are looking to buy a home here they want to know you know is 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 this going to continue like this or is there a kind of an end point that we're going to see some relief because I can say that um, you know people do when they're looking for homes, if they have children, they do look to try and locate in our district. You know, ours is one of the districts that is highly regarded, and uh, people actually, you know, people want to live in because of the education system. Transportation uh, pays costs for transporting it's state and property tax money. Um, State revenue is 57, and property taxes are 43. So, no other local. No, <laughs> we used to have that when we actually charge for our uh, activity buses, and I don't think we charge for sport, sports runs, but for the sports activity buses and things that would take kids home afterwards, we used to charge for that. But because we're either bringing them to the school or taking them home. It ended up being better for us just to claim them as regular transportation mileage. Now, when we take kids to sporting events, so like if we take uh, the basketball team to a location or the cross country team to a location for a meet, we can't claim that in reimbursement, uh, which is the state money, but we can't use, have to use our property tax money for those. And this um, kind of shows again salary and benefits is a little over half of the cost. Uh, I did put a little bit more money in there for purchase services. I think I'd mentioned previously that with the bus driver shortage that we're trying to use with some of our um, students that we can use uh, cabs to transport them uh, as we desperately search to find more drivers. Um, but we're at least in better shape than some of the other districts um, in Lake County. I mean, there's some of them that have had to add, and I, I was worried that we might have to for a while, but have had to add, like for instance last year when we had two different groups of students coming here to the elementary, you had your younger students and then you brought the older students next. Uh, because then you can use the same number of people, but get more, more bang for your buck as far as transporting students. It's pretty basic here. Retirement Social Security, um, which is a fund that we, we do have. Uh, there's a separate levy for IMRF and a separate levy for the Social Security Medicare portion. Okay, uh, capital projects. Um, we did transfer some dollars at the end of last year into capital projects funds. Um, 
there's about 1.1 million budgeted. I typically budget the bulk of the money that I know will be in there so that if something happens or if we determine to do something during the year that we have the dollars already allocated and we don't have to amend the budget. Um, we do still have, and I think some of them are on tonight's uh, agenda to approve uh, asbestos abatement and flooring work that was completed before school started. Uh, there also is a $50,000 matching grant from the state this year that's due October 1st. Uh, I'll schedule the architect out to uh, sit down with us and look at some options. Uh, one of the things that, you know, there are several things that we could look at. The one that I think is probably, I'm guessing is probably the most in need at this point is the East Gym Room. We did a partial, basically that has um, brick walls that come up around it and it's basically a ballasted roof, which is a roof that has rock on top of it. But we had where the part that was on the wall portion was separating and you could actually see down into the wall of the gym. We did repair it just on those portions that curled around the edges. Uh, probably six years ago maybe. Uh, so I do want to look at the condition of that roof and see if that's something, it's actually the oldest roof in the district at this point, uh, to see if that's something that might make sense to use those matching dollars for um, and get an estimate from the architect as to what that would cost. We've also talked about, you know, looking at gradually replacing some of the flooring through the building, you know, in the 78 edition, some of the other editions, um, you know, we could also look at um, abating the one section that we didn't do this summer and replacing it, although that tile is still in better shape than the tile that's only 20 to, actually just 78, that's getting 40 years old. Uh, but it, it, you know, one of those things we have to look at the condition and see what we could do there. We've also looked at, um, talked about the option of a keyless entry system for the building because we have, especially on the weekends when teachers have keys and the weekends or holidays when the building's closed, it's not unusual for Jason or I or custodian or somebody else to get a call that somebody triggered the alarm and we come out to the building and walk the building to try to make sure nothing was stolen or bro broken into and typically it's just somebody who didn't read the email that the building was going to be closed that weekend they needed to stay out. With the keyless entry system, you can program those days in, so if they don't have a key, they can't get in. Okay. These are just some other things. Uh, some of the HVAC upgrades that we've talked about could come out of the SR3 funds. We also have a couple other areas in the buildings where we've got some issues. Um, that we could look at using some of that 400,000 from Ether's money. Um, you know, we still have the water issue. There are some things that and I need to probably get back with the company. They, they sent me part of the quote, but they didn't send me the other information that they promised me from last winter, I believe, was when we had the problem. Uh, we have talked about adding projectors and screens in the gymnasium to both buildings. Uh, if it was anything that needed to be bid, like we were doing a roof, we would be looking at bidding that probably December, January, so we get the best pricing. Um, and that's something that we can talk about, you know, possibly, you know, the next meeting or, but for the $50,000 matching grant, we have to come up with a project that we want to do prior to October 1st, when we, applications are due. Working cash is basically kind of a savings account or rainy day fund. Um, if it helps with cash flow, but it's also something that you can partially abate that money and put it into another fund. When we look at um, actually the auditors and uh, the state kind of as part of the education fund. 
So it is money that with resolution we can shift uh, permanently or we can borrow from it. When I first came here, we had maybe three or four thousand in that fund, and then every year we emptied it out and started over again. So that is one of the things that I tried to, you know, we're putting in 50, 50 or 60,000 a year to kind of build that up so that uh, it kind of gives you something to, to fall back on in case it's an emergency. So we're now, what, 630,000, I believe it says. That's 683 by the end of this year. We should be somewhere in that range. Short fund expenditures, this is a separate levy as well. We pay a portion of the workers' comp premium, a portion of our liability insurance, and we also use that to pay attorney's fees. And that's one that the balance was getting a little higher, the cash balance a little higher than what. I think if it's two and a half times an annual, um, your an normal annual expenditure, then the large taxpayers a lot of times will file a, an appeal and request part of that money back. So I try to adjust that levy periodically so that we don't ever get to that point. Because uh, that did happen to me early on in my career here. And, you know, I never like to give money back once we've collected it. Does I have any questions? That's kind of a good summary. Um, and then I, in the drive, I also shared with you the actual uh, budget, and, and I put it in there so it comes out in Google Sheets. So you can actually click the tabs, and um, it's a little bit easier than trying to go through a PDF that uh, scrolls from item to item. Does anyone have questions for Dr. Jones? Do we have a motion on the budget? I'd like to make a motion to approve the public display of the tentative budget for 2022. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Federini? Yes. Mr. Kenyoni? Yes. Ms. Ball? Yes. Mr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Gray? Yes. Mr. Lorenzen? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. The motion fails. Um, let's take a look at the construction change order. Any motion on that? Jason, you want to check out, click on my report? I actually have a photo showing we had probably over half of the rooms were impacted. Scroll down, you'll see a picture. Second like page. Yeah. So basically, in, in the older portion of the building, and we had had this previously when we'd done some minor abatement. Um, that where the slab meets up against the foundation, it's pulled back, and then there's a uh, basically a void there. And so the two thousand dollars, I think, I know it was in my office and Carly's office, the office across the hall, and at least three of the four classrooms that they did. So I, I can't remember Adam is in your space. You had that. As, I think there may have been some in that space as well. Um, but it's just that separation, and so then they sold that so that they could uh, put the flooring on and you didn't have to worry about uh, having a void underneath the floor. I mean, it makes perfect sense that that has to be done. Yeah. But you can't imagine a whole slab moving. Has the architect looked at that and determined what it we, might we be? We did look at it at that point in time, yeah. and, and part of it was when they used to, part of it is the heaving, et cetera you know, the heaving and thawing of the ground underneath. Um, but a part of it, I think, was just the age. We, we really don't know why it did it, but I know the flooring people said it's not unusual for them to see that. Uh, but I know that 
and I don't know how they do it now, but I know that the it used to be they would do the foundation and then the floor was poured afterwards. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a matter of um, shrinking or shifting of the uh, of that floor. But it is something that was is kind of throughout that entire area. Did they mention maybe expansion zone or something that, that could have just brought it over time? There could have been, um, and it could also have been if, if there was, we, now especially along the northern side of, of the classrooms from the 61 edition, mm -hmm. we did used to have a lot of problem with water um, cooling in that exterior area, and we ended up doing a uh, French drain there to get that water away from the building because water was actually coming into the building. So we, you know, we also at the time, I guess it's been three or four years ago, was when Spectrum was still here that we had this problem. And we also wondered if possibly there was water getting underneath the building that was washing away some of that soil and then causing some of the seeps from that to collapse. Like to make a motion to approve the construction change order uh, from Consolidated Chicago to fill approximately an inch of openings at the edge of the concrete slab, the exterior foundation, and several rooms at a cost of $2,016. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Federini? Yes. Mr. Cignoni? Yes. Ms. Vaughn? Yes. Mr. Foman? Yes. Mr. Gray? Yes. Mr. Lanson? Yes. The motion passed. Okay. Shared services report. Now, this is actually something that does require board approval, and then this becomes a part of our annual financial report that the auditors uh, will do along with the audit. So basically, it, it talks about the coordination with the feeder schools, uh, our early childhood and autistic programs that we opened in nearby districts, which are those tuition student aid students we talked about. We participate in a cooperative with other uh, school districts and public libraries. Uh, the Illinois Utility Purchasing Cooperative. Uh, we use a vendor for our food service, the health insurance, uh, the uh, liability insurance. We use vendors for uh, HVAC services. Um, we have you, we do work with the Regional Office of Education, Northeastern Illinois University, Maxim, which is who we had our nurse from that we have this year, uh, as well as uh, local personnel directors, uh, the Lake County ROE. Uh, last year we shared a speech therapist with ANI District 34. Um, that's something that we still are looking for somebody to fill that position. So if we find somebody, that will continue. We do seed all, as well as uh, last year we had, last couple years we've had students at NSSEO, which is another special ed cooperative. We also coordinate with the feeder schools for Warren, Grace Lake, and, and District 117. Uh, this year we have a student attending a math class at District 117. Uh, we have had students attending classes at Warren, as well as um, Grace Lake High School in the past as well. Um, we use a part of the cooperative for our uh, custodial and maintenance supplies, and we use State Bridge and other purchasing cooperatives, and we lease our buses from Midwest Transit. Any other questions? We have a motion. I'd like to make a motion to approve the report on shared services. Second. Roll call, please. Mr. Lawrenson? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Federini? Yes. Mr. Signoni? Yes. Ms. Ball? Yes. Mr. Coleman? Yes. Mr. Gray? Yes. The motion passed. Mm -hmm. um, a memorandum of understanding for Mobile Federation of Teachers regarding hybrid instruction. 
Can you remind us, Mr. Dr. Lee? Um, yeah. So we discussed the possibility of giving uh, teachers a more uh, money. And I won't go into detail because that would be something that we can go into closed session if you have additional questions about. But um, I've forwarded that to the board. And if we approve it and then the union approves it, that would be a go. So only for a hybrid learning environment when a teacher is teaching in the classroom with students both in person and remote because there's extra potential for, um, well there's not potential, there is extra for um, trying to manage two environments at the same time and manage students in two environments. So that only happens by um, state statute when students have, are in quarantine for a COVID related illness. It does not happen for vacations, it doesn't happen for strep throat, it doesn't happen for Chicken pox, although nobody gets chicken pox anymore, but if they did, people won't count. It's only for COVID. Does anyone have any questions? I don't have any questions, but I, I, I've talked with you about yeah. it, and I, I, I don't feel comfortable with it. Um, three reasons. One, you know, they're going to be teaching hybrid for the next, whatever, this is the new normal. As far as we know, this is the new normal. So we're asking them to pay them to do essentially the job as is what they're supposed to be doing. Um, your normal standard job. You know, if, if me in a corporate world, the, the governor comes and says, hey, we have to do this in a certain setting. It's different than what you've done it in the past. It's going to cost you more to do it. I don't get a raise. I get told, hey, that's what the government says. If you don't want it, here's a cardboard box. You know, and that's one. Two, um, it's, it's just, it's difficult to say, looking at where we are now and what might be coming down the road, that people are going to be more, people might be losing more jobs. You know, it, it's hard to sit there and say, hey, the teachers deserve a raise, but you, your company's going to have to shut down. Three, we're about to be going towards negotiations with the union. There is nothing that prevents the union from turning around and saying, hey, we want this permanently. And instead of 60 bucks per hour, we want 80, 100, or 120. So, I, I you know, I think that's more on the union to come to us and ask about that. So that's where I sit. Any other comments, questions? I won't be voting on this because I don't like them. I'm a teacher. Anybody else? I'd like to make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding from Melbourne Federation of Teachers regarding hybrid instruction. Um, Walt Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Lewiston? No. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Petterini? Yes. Mr. Quinone? Yes. Mr. Coleman? Present. Ms. Bob? Yes. The motion is there. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda. Does anyone have anything they'd like to pull out of the consent agenda? We have a motion on this. I'd like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Do we have any discussion on this? Um, roll call, please, Brown. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Mr. Gray? Yes. Mr. Lawrenson? Yes. Mr. Murphy? Yes. Mr. Federini? Yes. Mr. Pignoni? Yes. Ms. Vaughn? Yes. The motion passed. Information and discussion. The administrator and salary benefit report. This is a report that just has to be 
uh, presented to the board. It doesn't have to be voted on, but it is something that we do every year. And for whatever reason, uh, speech therapists, and there's a handful of positions that aren't on there because the state doesn't consider them teaching positions. Um, but basically this lists each teacher, what their role is, their base salary, their full-time equivalency, um, if there's any retirement enhancers or any other benefits, which typically is the insurance benefit. So that's for each individual. This is something that we have to report to the state every year, um, and it's due in, in the middle of August. So uh, once we got to that deadline, then I pull up the report and print it and present it, and then we'll also post it on the website under the business office section. Other questions on this? Martin Luther King Jr. Breakfast and Day of Service. In the past, we have done uh, Martin Luther King Breakfast, and hopefully, we can plan to do that again. And just a reminder of that celebration um, two years ago now, because COVID put the squash on that last year. Didn't have any in person. Um, this is um, what we did. We had a breakfast. We invited middle school students and elementary students along with their parents in. We had breakfast and a short video, and we um, celebrated some of the activities that the middle school students did. Middle school students did a day of service. And Dr. King was uh, emphasized service and uh, putting others above self. Which is, Part of his um, story, and so one of that's a way to honor him. And at the middle school, was serve, and they served at the food bank, uh, Horizons, uh, Bernie's Built Bank, and Pat. And then we took some video of that during the week, and then showed that at the celebration at the MLK breakfast. So if anybody's interested in providing some ideas or helping out in planning with that this year. Uh, please let me know. Who um, is generally in charge of organizing all this? And who has in the past? Is that a, a generally? There was, there was, uh, we had a staff committee last time. We, we had support with board members, uh, and I believe Denise and um, Audrey helped out other community members so we'll recruit community members and staff members to help with that again and uh, Henry Mayer did the video did a great job with that so, and that was all volunteer stuff they did or? yep all volunteer so if we have a board member who or two who'd like to volunteer I would love to I well, volunteer. Uh, makes it easy thank you <laughs> Great. You guys should consider Lance Farm, the organization. I know I've worked with, like my company works with them, and they, they just had a thing where they asked if we could um, help paint some like, woodworking stuff, and then they would sell them in their stores. So it was just so that they had service? Well, no, just in general, just generally, but they do do a lot of stuff like that now that it's virtual. Of course, it's going in and right. just helping them out. Uh, site-based expenditure report. Okay, this is another uh, item that uh, we're required to share with the board, but this is another report that we have to submit to the state. They look at, and there are only certain uh, certain funds that they use, um, certain account numbers that they use to determine this, but it looks at a cost per student uh, for the elementary versus the middle school. Um, so the cost per student at the elementary, both state and federal dollars and local dollars, is $15,753.06 for last year. For the middle school, it's $16,243, so about $500 difference between the elementary and the middle school. And a part of that is just because the middle school is a small
smaller building, smaller number of students, but yet you still have the same building costs as far as uh, heating, cooling, utilities, uh, staffing, et cetera, that, that you may have at a, the elementary building that has more students. Um, and this becomes part of the report card that, do they mail that home or does that get emailed or how do parents get that? But it becomes part of the state report card. This, this goes into the state report card. We post on the website. Okay. And then kind of, if you look at the graph on the next page, it kind of, you know, kind of shows you that pretty much. Now, part of what they're trying to get you to look at is, especially districts with large numbers of, of school buildings, to make sure that you're not disproportionately or, or not doing it without a rationale as to why one may be getting a higher level of funding than another another building. Correct. But with only the $500 in between, we're fairly comparable uh, yes. as far as what we're spending on the two buildings. Well, middle schools in general are more expensive right. to operate because there's more activity. Um, and just the way our schedule is right. um, designed, they're more expensive. I'm surprised it's actually this close. I, I was too. Um, but yes. Steve was saying that the intent behind this exercise is for districts um, that are larger, that have multiple elementary schools, that may have diversity in certain uh, neighborhoods, they have neighborhood schools, and to make sure that the expenditures are equal amongst each of the schools. So that. Yeah, or you could justify spending more in one area because of poverty or whatever, but, yep. but for you to kind of really once a year look at how we're spending our dollars uh, on our children. Yep. This has probably been a requirement for probably the last three or four years. I think it didn't it come about the same time as the EGS yep. funding came. Yep. Questions? Future agenda items, uh, press policy uh, as usual, budget review and adoption, so we posted it and then we will review it one more time and then adopt it for two, two more meetings from now. Uh, salary compensation report and the house week. Does anybody have anything else that to be on there? Okay. Superintendent's report. Okay. Um, in the next day or so, you're probably going to get an email along with the rest of the school district on our testing. To uh, we need to gather permission from parents to start doing the shield testing and the Binax now testing. So there's two different types of tests for COVID. One is a surveillance testing where if parents opt into it. Not going to force anybody to do that. We would love to have people do it because it's going to help us out a lot down the road, especially if we move toward a situation where we can start reducing mitigations to have the evidence that say, look, there's no COVID in our school and it's not spreading. And we have evidence of that. I think we'll have more um, more rationale behind us and more evidence behind us to be able to do that. But that's guessing at this point, although that was where we were headed in early July and then it all changed. So, But anyway, uh, it also helps us know where breakouts might be happening in the school district. So it can help us get ahead of things before they get out of control and keep kids in, this, in the classroom, which is our main goal for this year. So hopefully a majority of our parents uh, sign up for that. We would really appreciate that. So shield testing is a, is a gathering saliva. So it's not invasive. There's nothing that goes into the nose. The kids will spit into a little vial. And they need to fill it up to a certain level. They cap it, they put it in a bin, and they're, they're done. So I will send out a video that kind of shows the process for that for parents. And I'm gathering all kinds of different information, and then they can choose to sign up for that. So hopefully that gets done quickly. We need to move quickly on this to get started as soon as possible. 
The other test is the Binance Now test, which um, is developed locally at Abbott, our friends at Abbott. And that one is a little bit more invasive. It does require no swab. It's not the deep, deeper tissue, but um, goes into the nose, swirl it around. The nurse, our, nur our own nurses can uh, administer that test and 15 minutes later find out if uh, their kids are COVID positive. That one, though, is reserved only for symptomatic individuals. And so what we're trying to find out is there's still some questions about exactly how that works. But we would know within 15, if a student is sent down to the nurse or a teacher or a paraprofessional, goes to the nurse and says, you know, was feeling okay this morning, now I'm not feeling so great. Takes that Binax now test in 15 minutes. We could, if it's positive, we know that's a positive, and now we do our contact tracing and have to quarantine kids. If it's negative, we're pretty sure they don't have it, but then they would have to go get that confirmed at another with a PCR test. Because there are false positive, false negatives, but it's False positives are very rare. So if it, if you're symptomatic and if it tests positive, it's 98, I believe, percent accurate, which is pretty nice. But I don't know is if it's a negative, what that next step is yet. That yeah, that's a question because even with the high school last year, the process was even if you tested negative with the PCR test, you still had to quarantine. Yeah, that's not, yeah, right. I don't okay. think that's the case this year. Okay. Uh, now, this is changing all the time, and it's very confusing, so don't hold, hold me at our word. We do whatever the Lake County Health Department but, okay, call so them. The Department of Public Health is providing guidance if they're like, correct. Okay, good. Yep. Good. So that first test that you mentioned, the SHIELD? SHIELD test. So SHIELD is a surveillance test. So the idea is you, you test uh, um, at least a sampling of your entire student body, preferably most of your stu student body weekly. So that was my question. Like, is it expected that everyone's going to be tested weekly, or is it going to be a random sample? It would be everyone that signs up. That signs that, that opted yeah, in. That opted in, which hopefully is a significant percentage. Otherwise, it's not going right. to do anything. So is there a, a percentage where it becomes um, useful. Why do we know that? It's like it's not even worth it because only 40% of the right. students are taking it. I don't know. I've asked that question and, and there is no number currently. Okay. It, it being non invasive, like just with the Eliza test, why can't we just mandate it? Say, through um, because we can. We're gathering bio, biometric information on COVID. So our, I was on a webinar a few weeks ago with attorneys across the state, and they represented five different school attorney firms. One of our, one was Hodges, which is our firm, and Angler, which is one of another firm that we use. And they were, that, on that question, there was other questions where they were a little bit like one attorney said, well, on that one it was no across the board. This don't do the opt out, do an opt in when, it, when you're talking about medical things. Even though this is not in, invasive, you're still gathering biometric information on kids. You just want parents on board, and it's better. Could a parent opt in on one and opt out on another? Yeah. Like if, if, if they don't want to be part of the weekly sample that's fine but if the kid's sick you know and they go down to the nurse right hey test them and the nurse would call them um yeah that's possible but it's a real pain because you'd have to fax in a well yeah we'd have to figure out a form for that how to get that signal is it, is it a, a opt-in for both or is an opt-in for what i was pointing <laughs> each one Good question because I'm working through the form right now. Okay. I wanted to do both, and then 
with the Binax, we would notify the nurse would notify you if they're doing a Binax test and get the confirmation, but we'd already have the permission on file. Right. And if you're going to say no, not to do the Binax, we're not going to do it. But say I want, say I want the my kid sick. Want I want the Binax because the kid's sick and it's like, hey, but I don't want the kid tested every week because I think that's ridiculous. Right. You know. Um, Could I, is, there, is there a way to set that up? Yes, there's okay. a way to set that up. And Jason, is there a required participation rate for mm -hmm. SHIELD before they will agree to come out? I mean, will they, if only 10% of the students will? They said their minimum was 100 on that last call. Okay, okay. Yeah. so minimum of 100 yeah. students. Okay, that's I think what about 9% just have to agree on that one. Yeah. Does this stuff cost? Cost? Zero? It costs us, you know, energy and time. Right. And the turnaround time for the shield test? Well, what what they're claiming now is that if we do, let's say we do a, a test thing on first graders on Tuesday morning between 9 and 10. So actually, we could probably do two grades almost here. We could do second and third grade Tuesday morning uh, between 9 and 10 30 let's say they get that those vials to the lab we know before the next morning before school starts the results of those. Mm -hmm. but we don't like Jose asked there's no actual percentage number we need like we don't know there's no guidance percentage no. so if we said oh it's 70 percent of your kids are good you're in good shape we don't even know that so it could just be testing just to test. So you have 100 kids, 10 of them got tested and don't have anything. So what? That, like unless there's an actual number percent to compare it to, what does it matter? Right. That's why I would hope we get more than that. Right. All right. So if a, if a parent decides to up their children out, and that kid starts feeling bad in the middle of the day, they don't take the Binax test. Like, what's, what's the, the process? They just have to leave school? Yeah, if they have COVID symptoms and refuse any any testing, they're out for 10 days. Just off the bat. Off the bat. Makes sense. Which gets tricky. But so they're good. vaccinated. Um, if they're vaccinated and they have symptoms, Well, they, they can't be back to this young, yeah. right? Uh, middle middle school. School. Middle school. Oh, they can in middle school? Yeah. Okay. Some seventh and eighth graders should, could, could all be vaccinated. Wow. What are the other districts doing with this, like particularly this shield stuff? Um, well, they're all starting with us. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> We're all figuring it out. Um, those that have done it, um, the Woodland started doing it in summer school. They did a sampling because they, I don't know what percentage they could even possibly do it. Woodlands are so huge, but they did a percentage of their summer school kids. So they're a little bit ahead, ahead of the game. Lace has been doing it. I know they had 25% of their students opt in before. And I don't know if they're doing a sampling of those 25% that we meet with the team on Wednesday, so we can put questions over with the answer. And do they, they, so you'll find out if they have results on Wednesday. Yeah. And, uh, and accuracy as well, like is the fit test 98. lower? That's 98. And then the Binax is 98, 98, 98 as well. Pretty, both of them are very high. Pretty solid. The Binax, the, the rapid test, if it's positive, if you if you're symptomatic and it's positive, that's a pretty sure. If you're symptomatic and it's negative, then you have to get a PCR test to confirm that. Okay. Because it's not as accurate on that scenario. Still pretty good, but. So there'd be no reason to double up. Say I came in and I did on Monday, you find out Tuesday morning, I got it. I just go home. 
I don't need to do the buy next on top. No, no, no. Do you go confirm that, or do you just call them in the morning and say, you know, have a request and they don't get it? Yeah, we would call you, or the company would call you and say, uh, your results came back positive. You cannot come to school today. And they're, they're reported to the West County Health Department as well. Because we have to. Yeah. If we have it by law, we have to report any known positive. We, do, we don't have a choice. I don't know who's positive and negative necessarily, but that's not all of our results. That's right. where the people get confused about confidentiality. But if there's a, a reason, like the nurse has to know, and the Lake County Health Department, they have to have to know. Any other questions? Any so that, that's coming up. Um, next couple of days and it'll be confusing but hopefully we'll clear, clear that up as we go. Um, Jason, real quick on that, when will people receive some communication regarding that? Tomorrow. The opportunity to opt in for it tomorrow. Or when, maybe Wednesday. Okay. But I need to get that information back from parents by Monday. Okay. So I'm creating a form to make it easier. Yeah. So when they sign up, it's already formatted to the spreadsheet that we need to upload to uh, Vista Healthcare or Visit Visit Healthcare is the name of the company that will be collecting the samples. Will um, Will staff also be staff will be uh, yes they'll be asked yes or so. We may consider um, for athletics in order to participate to opt into that. We can do that. A lot of school districts are doing that for sports or clubs after school. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely okay as, as a condition of doing that extracurricular because it's not part of your core educational experience. And kids, you're adding a level of risk, so it makes sense. Um, my other thing is I'm going to Springfield on Thursday night through Saturday again for a leadership training and so this will be my third session of the leadership training and part of the training is trying to narrow down district goals and set goals for the district personal goals too but the whole idea is to get clarity on where we're headed and what we need to accomplish as a, as a district and working through that with our administrative team, our teacher leader team, school board, getting everybody out and getting it more systematized than we've done in the past so we have these discussions. So a lot of our discussion in the last year has been distracted by uh, COVID, uh, clearly. And so I'd like to get back to the teaching and learning aspect of, hey, how are we doing? Uh, instruction, you know, curriculum. What are we teaching our kids? Why are we teaching our kids that? Let's, let's get back to that discussion. So I'm looking forward to shifting that and trying to do that without and push some of these, these distractions are important. Testing is important. Health is important. Absolutely fundamentally important. Safety is important. And with our mission is to educate kids. So we, we do need to return to those conversations. And we started, um, not we, not me, the administrative team and a group of teacher leaders started looking at PLCs. So you're going to hear that term PLC. Some of you are shaking your head. Yes, you know, you've heard that term before if you're in the education world. But if you're not, we're going to learn a lot about what a PLC is. It's a professional learning community, but it's a specific um, framework how do you systematically talk about student learning setting clear targets in each grade level some of the things we've talked about as a board where we just don't have quite clarity and not a lot of vertical articulation yet 
um, from grade to grade what is each student expected to know to be able to do at the end of each grade level beginning of each grade level where should they be what are our expectations for our kids and we can have those conversations about behaviors we can have those conversations about different learning as well so it's it's a framework and it's a system for having those conversations and setting those targets so I'm excited about that and that kind of ties into well not kind of it ties into my um, ISO leadership but it's been something that the leadership team in the district has always started so we will have more conversation about that and it ties back into our student questions so that's the kind of alignment and articulation we really want to get towards so we're all on the same page and the board has, has a clear understanding of where we're headed our parents have a clear understanding teachers support staff all of it so we just need to have time for us to get our thoughts together and not be so scattered and focused elsewhere on cafeteria tables and such which are also important Is that all you want to say? You can answer that. <laughs> can I? You got nowhere to go. Yeah, you do. <laughs> you all do. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Um, Dr. John, our business report. Only a couple things we haven't already talked about. Um, originally, our guests that were supposed to be here at the end of the ship, the end of July, are actually now we're going to get a partial shipment this Thursday. Uh, the elementary is going to get 206 of the 250 desks that were ordered with five chairs and the middle school is going to get 90 chairs which you're still in pretty good shape with the desks that you got there but but these were basically chairs we were going to use to replace other other desks in the building uh, but the elementary we, we definitely do need them we do have plenty of chairs already but uh, currently we've got kids sitting on one chair and eating off another chair in the cafeteria six feet apart so this will actually give some of them desks to be able to uh, eat on and probably we won't have those assembled until the beginning of next week because they do come with the legs off so you can put the legs on and assemble them um, but we'll take a little bit of time to get them all put together but hopefully by next week we'll have uh, a little bit more um, comfortable eating arrangement for students Oh, the other item and I'll be talking about this with the administrative team tomorrow to kind of just ask them to give, give me a count um, there was a house bill 156 that requires menstrual hygiene products made available in bathrooms of every school building that are open for student use in grades 4 through 12. previously they only had to be made available in uh, girls or women's restrooms now they have to be made available in every restroom grades 4 through 12. Uh, so we'll need to determine what that count is so that I can order the dispensers uh, and we can put those in the, the restroom. Dr. Stephen, I don't understand. Um... Basically, the concept of this is to, if you would have a transgender student and they needed female, feminine or menstrual products, that those would be in the avail available in the restroom that that child uses. Where can we get female to male transgender students here at Pumpkin School? We need to use the men's restroom. And it's something that I knew had been passed by the legislature, but it wasn't signed by the governor until about a week ago. So. I was kind of holding off until we were sure that he signed it before I went and spent the money purchasing dispensers. So the district covered that? Yes, this is another unfunded mandate. So the How state tells us what we have to do and then we have to come up with the money to make it happen. How old are you in fourth grade? Nine? Yeah. Does this happen is that it, young? Yeah. Does it? Yeah, yeah. Usually it's, it's not common, but it can. Yeah. yeah. My very first year teaching. Oh, 
<laughs> Mom came in. I have to tell you. Oh man. Just in case my daughter goes to the bathroom, she needs to go. Poor sleep. That's all I got. Does anyone have questions for Dr. John? Do we currently have students, transgender students, using like a biologically male student using a female washroom compared to girls' washrooms or biologically female students using the boys' washroom? Um. They're free to sell these? Yes, we have to make them available at no charge. Just like we do the toilet paper and soap and other things that are in the restroom. So not only the cost of the dispenser, but the cost of the supplies is the district's cost. They're usually really crappy, they're not going to get used that often, trust yeah. me. Nobody wants to use vending machine products. No one's shaking that thing to get anything free anyway. I know when we the did the only. Do you remember how many years ago we put those in? It was probably about four or five. And I think that maybe just this summer I got a request from the middle school that they needed to order some more. So whatever we ordered initially. So the biggest it's cost is the five. dispenser. But no, they're I actually have an obscure concern about the younger boys interiors and that sort of stuff. And, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's that was going to be my okay. question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know my four year old's going to take them and just throw them in the toilet. It's not just you that, know, but you probably you may not have had the discussion with a boy on how the, the female and male anatomies are different, right? So mm -hmm. we'll be that discussion. Well, they're going to have to be. I guess my concern probably is more at the middle school, just hoping that, you know, that they don't flush them down the toilets or do something like that too. Oh, that's totally to get, all, yeah, get that's the cycle going. I mean, yeah. that's that's where I have most of my concern. The elementary kids are usually, you know, you can tell them no, you know, don't do that, and then they stop. But the, the middle school students, uh, I mean, we even had to. Um, the ceiling tile in, in one section of the middle school because the boys were popping the tiles and looking over into the girls' restroom. Uh, so, <laughs> what? For you, innovative? So, what? Um, on, well, I guess it's innovative. Are there, um, is there any type of education for any grade level around transgender discussion? There's a lot available actually. I'm a member of the HRC, so if we were, that was something we were look, looking into, I could get you some group deals in for one does something really good. Well, I could get information on that easily. Well, I mean, I'm just wondering in, 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 in the school, right, because we're making the assumption, and then maybe this is just me, but we're making the assumption that children will have had that discussion with their parents or with someone to understand why it is that a, a quote unquote girl is going into a boys' bathroom or vice versa. Right? Not a quote unquote girl. It is a girl. Well, no, no. I'm just saying, like, um, I'm just sorry. Fair. I'm just pretty picky about it. Fair. Um, Can so we say biological. Yeah. Way, right. So I, I'm just curious if that, if any kind of education like that is happening, so that there isn't confusion as to why why is this happening. Like, what what are, what is a what's going to happen when a child asks that question? You could easily say that those aren't for you. If it's, um, if, it's a, if it's a third grade student or a second grade student. Just, well, isn't the state going to be mandating yeah, I thought that, stuff yeah, didn't it? coming? I don't know if it's still on the desk or. If yeah, it's with like the LGBT. 
that was included or something, so there's going to be more of a, yeah. a push to include all of that. Yeah. It's like yeah, the next normal curriculum. Yeah, and that was steadily less. I mean, I think that that was more. I don't think it was really too much about the sex, like the sex as far as being, you know, having your period and those kind of things. You're going to start very soft. Oh, yeah. Gradual. You're okay. going to be addressing those kind of right. issues at that point. Did Even most of the education stuff I was referencing wouldn't be different yeah. things like periods. Okay. You know, the Did the state offer any other guidance to school districts <coughs> on the implementation of this and potential ramifications and things they deal with, or did they just? Pass it and no, just so that it, it's um, when he signs it, then it's immediately enforced. So technically, we should have had those in place August 14th, but there's also a back order on those products as well. So, so we we will have to have some communication with parents to let them know if this is happening. If there's any questions, how to guide parents on where to go for those questions with kids. We have not had that discussion yet because this has just happened last year. So that I think when we did the other dispensaries, we had some communication either with students or with parents, mm -hmm. letting them know that those were available and uh, if they were uncomfortable, they could also go to the nurse's office and get them. Because one, one of the things that I value and that this district has valued is that we communicate with parents what's happening in school. We don't want none of us like society so whatever we're doing in the school district good bad or indifferent we should tell parents what's happening so that they can have conversations with their kids if they feel that that's appropriate i'm just looking at the bill here and i don't know if it's absolutely current but i'm looking at it and it says this bill does not create a state mandate and the, even the verbiage in the bill I'm looking at the Illinois General Assembly. The verbiage in the bill says shall make. It doesn't say must be. And I know typically shall and must, there's differentiation here. Has that been confirmed that this is a mandate or not a mandate? That's my understanding. My understanding is that the shall means that we will. Yeah, shall is shall. Shall means we have, we will. So it's very similar to the last bill that was for the um, women's or girls' restrooms. Well, it would still be best practices, at least in the middle schools, at the very least, to make sure we're including them in both bathrooms. Yeah. Elementary school, with the younger, I can see, but at the very least, it should be in the middle school, mandated or not, and that's the proper thing to do for a student. Mm -hmm. And this this bill talks about fourth grade or not. Yeah. yeah. This bill requires fourth grade. Yeah. Anything else? You have anything else there, Dr. John? No, nothing else. Uh, we don't have a uh, board report. Do we have any board reports? I was at the middle school while they were doing um, supply drop off. Met a lot of parents and kids, uh, old and new friends. Uh, it looked like it was going well. A lot of people were pretty excited. A lot of people were lost. <laughs> um, but it uh, looked like they were uh, ready to come to school. Uh, it, it was a well-run program and, and saw a lot of parents and kids looking forward to it. Even because they went to the uh, epic meeting or epic uh, movie night. Movie night. Uh, well, not it was very nice. Yeah, it was nice. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Mm -hmm. well, um, we do not have a closed session. So we are not returning to open session. We don't have any action items left. Uh, I motion that we adjourn here. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And opposed? We are adjourned. Have a great night. Thank you.